Amen. Okay, at this Amen. time, we turn it over to Pastor Al. Amen. Praise God. You know, I was in the back uh, fumbling with my robe and the equipment, and I was listening to Pastor Leslie as she was leading us in our song of prep. And God spoke to me. He said, it is amazing how we will praise, make big, lift up everyone else but him. We, 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 we will go out of our way for a retirement party. And at the retirement party, you know, someone will be thinking, this boss, this supervisor, this person that hired them, this person that promoted them, this person that worked with them. But hardly ever do we hear someone say, thank you, God, for the job that kept food on my table for 30, 40 years. Amen. We, we go to wedding banquets and anniversary celebrations. And we sit here and we listen to people thank the, uh, the, the couple of the moment, of the hour, uh, for demonstrating their love. We thank them for showing us what marriage looks like. We congratulate them. They get up, they thank everyone, their mama, their daddy, their neighbor, their auntie, their pastor, who over the years has blessed them and, and helped them become. But we never, ever thank God for thinking enough of us to send us the person that was going to love us in spite of ourselves. I'm saying that to say, especially in light of this week, uh, it shouldn't require so much for us to praise the Lord. We should be able to give him the praise he so rightfully deserves freely. In fact, the psalmist says, when I think of all the goodness that he has shown me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying to help somebody. Y'all will get that. Y'all will get that. Because, in fact, let me say this. No, all right, thank you, God. Let me say this. Let me say this. You do know life. It's not in your prayer, it's in your praise. God extends life to those who extend him praise because he lives off the praise we give. And so if you want to guarantee an increase, expand, enlarge the amount of time that you have here on the earth, you ought to get comfortable praising God. Now, guess what? You ain't got to be rah-rah with it all the time. Something I say all the time that my, if even my friends tease me, I'll say, amen, praise God. It doesn't matter what it is. Okay, we're going to get something. Amen, praise God. We're going to destroy. Amen, praise God. When my wife said, I'm tired, I want to go home. Amen, praise God. Amen. She said she's going upstairs to watch the housewives. Amen, praise God. But I say it all the time. That's my way of praising the Lord God Almighty. You are going to have to find a way to praise him. Simple thank you, Jesus. Or amen. However you do it, you're going to need to find that way to praise him. Because again, life is found in the praise, not the prayer. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. So, let me do, let me, let me, let me, let me not delay Terry here. Amen. Let's look at our scripture this morning. It comes from Matthew chapter 8. We're going to look at verses 22 through 25. Matthew chapter 8 verses 22 to 25. While you're finding that, let me again echo Deacon uh, Charlton. Deacon Stiles taught a phenomenal Sunday school class this morning. It was phenomenal. Uh, amen. Pastor Leslie is going to teach next weekend. It's going to be phenomenal. You need to be here for that. You just can't come to service at 10 o'clock and think you're getting everything God has for you. God is doing some things in Sunday school. 
and you really need to be here. So I invite you next Sunday to be here, 845, right here in the sanctuary, uh, and to have Sunday school with us. Amen. For those who have it and don't mind standing for the reading of the word, would you please stand uh, for that reading? The New Revised Standard Version of Matthew chapter 8, verses 22 through 25 reads as follows. Jesus, the disciples, and his other followers came to Bethesda. But Bethsaida, I'm sorry. Some people brought a blind man to Jesus and begged him to touch the man. Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had put saliva on the man's eyes and laid his hands on him, Jesus asked the man, can you see anything? And the man looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on the man's eyes again, and the man looked intently, and his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Then Jesus sent him away to his home, saying, do not even go into the village. Amen. Praise God. Thus far, the word of God, you may be seated in his presence. Amen. The title of today's sermon is, What Do You See? What do you see? Amen. Praise God. Now, uh, you know what? I'm sorry. I said Matthew chapter 8. That should have said Mark chapter 8. This is from Mark, not Matthew. So if you're looking at Matthew chapter 8, like, wait a second, I don't see the scripture. I apologize. It's Mark. I've, I didn't correct that on my, on, on my presentation, but it's Mark. But the, the story in Mark chapter 8, about Jesus enabling the man of Bethsaida to see. It's a story we've heard pre preached and taught many times in the past. It's a favorite scripture of many uh, preachers, ministers, pastors. Uh, it speaks to God's ability, God's power. But when I read Mark chapter 8, verses 22 through 26, I am confounded by something present in the scripture. I see this scripture, and what I see is that Jesus' first time attempting to provide this man with sight, to restore his sight, did not work. Because Jesus touches the man's eyes, lays hands on the man's body, Sean, and then asks him, can you see anything? And the man says, I see people, but they look like trees walking. In other words, he can see, see but he can only see partially. Everything's blurry. And er er everything's out of focus. And, and, when I look, and when I look at this uh, scripture, Pastor Leslie, this is the only scripture in, 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 in the New Testament Gospels where Jesus has to do the same thing twice for the same person. Any other time that he performs ministry, it works immediately. The man at the pool uh, uh, with the five pillars, Jesus said, do you want to be healed? He said, he said well, there's no one to, 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 to put me in the water. He said, well, I'm here. I'll heal you. He was healed. The man that well, they lowered through the roof, he said, I know uh, that your sins are many, but I, I declare right now so that they would know that the man, the son of man has the power to forgive sins. I command you to get up, pick up your mat, and walk home. The man got up picked up his mat and walked home. Amen. Uh, the, the persons that had leprosy, when they reached out, Jesus said, uh, reach out again and their hands or arms or bodies were healed. Whenever Jesus did something, it worked immediately the first time. But we get right here to Mark chapter 8 and we see that it did not work the first time. Jesus had to go back and do it again. Now, if you like me, you've got a real problem with what that scripture is saying because we know that Jesus is perfect. We know that there is no fault in Jesus. There's no shortcoming in Jesus. That Jesus is the embodiment of the Lord God Almighty. And if he's the embodiment of the Lord God Almighty, then if the miracle didn't work, it didn't work because of, of the man and not Jesus. 
what was it about the man that kept him from receiving the miracle that God, that Jesus, that God wanted him to get. And I was looking through the, uh, the, the uh, test this, for this morning, and I realized something. Amen. God showed something to me, and I don't know if we've seen this before. Uh, I, I want to make the argument to you this morning that the reason why the man couldn't see is because when he once could see, he did not use his sight to the glory of God. Okay. All right. So you, 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 you're not following me. All right. So let me help you. Jesus spits in his hands, lays his hands on the man's head, his eyes, and then says to the man, tell me what you see. What do you see? The man says, I see people, check this, but they look like trees walking. If this man had been blind from birth, then how does he know what trees look like? He has never ever seen a tree in his life if he's been blind. And here's another thing. How do you know what it looks like to walk? How do you know what it looks like for a tree to walk? I've been living 50 years. I ain't seen one tree walk yet. In fact, in, in fact, they plant themselves and they don't move. But yet this man knows what it looks like to see trees walking. All right. Uh, so, so the question becomes, if he's never see, seen before, had the ability to see before, how does he know what anything looks like? He doesn't know purple from red. He doesn't know uh, a, a, a mountain from a molehill. He can't tell the six-time Super Bowl champion Pittsburgh Steelers from them Peon Dallas Cowboys. He doesn't know the distinction between anything, but yet here he can distinguish. That says to me that at some point this man could see. And at some point in his life, he lost the ability to see. Now in antiquity, the idea was that if you were born able to fully function, but and during your life you lost the ability to function, you were injured, you were paralyzed, you were maimed, you were killed, that's because God's judgment was on you. You had sinned, you had committed some sin where God found it necessary to inflict punishment for the sin upon you. Amen. Right then and there. And so if the, if the man could once see and he now can't, then somehow he did something which was a sin to God. And given, in, given light that this week is Thanksgiving, I believe God is wanting us to understand that the problem is the brother refused to see. It's not that he couldn't see, he refused to see. And let me tell you, had that with C as God sees. Amen. Amen. All of us are given abilities. All of us are given gifts. All of us are given blessings. And brother son, we're not given this so that we can pop our collars. Amen. A -a -a Amen. We, we weren't blessed on the job to get the promotion and the raises so that we can say we're the first black man, the first black woman to hold this position. We were put in these positions to be conduits, to be like prisms. Where God sends blessings and then we multiply the blessings out for other people. The problem with many of us, and not just this man in Mark chapter 8, is that we see people suffering every single day. In fact, in our minds, we think if a person is really suffering, they should look a certain way. In fact, y'all remember uh, Chris Rock's character Pookie from uh, New Jack City? He, <laughs> you got a little rock for me? You got a little rock? That's what we think people suffering, or they should be looking like a zombie. What's wrong with you? Many people are around us, look like everything is fine, but they're suffering right this very instant. 
We just talked about this during intercessory prayer. There are people right now who are broken hearted, who are broken, who are hurting, who are in, in, in they're in there in a place, a, a bad place right now, but they don't look bad. They still wear Gucci, Prada, Fendi, Louis Vuitton. They still smile. Hey, girl. Hey, girl. How you doing? Girl, I can't call it. Smokey Robinson told us about the tears of a clown. That a clown's job is to make you laugh. The whole time, we never think about how the clown is feeling on the inside himself. Persons are hurting. And because they don't look like they're hurting, we don't bother with them. I mean, I mean, it's, it's one thing when we pass by the homeless man or woman on the street and we try to act like they're not there. But it's another thing to pass by the woman or the child as being abused at home and we pretend like the reason why they're limping is because they got injured in the last 5K. When the last time you know them to run a 5K? You, you know, they don't even exercise. But the excuse you make in your, in your, your mind is, I'm not getting involved because there has to be a good explanation for this child, this woman, to be so injured like they are. It, brothers, we got to stop being punks. Let me, let me go ahead and give a PSA. We got to stop being punks. Okay. Uh, now, I know. I know. They can work our last nerves. Amen. Come on, Sean. You, you don't let the merit, brother. Deacon Rembrandt and Deacon Charlton run away on for me on this. So it'd be just two of us. I know. I know that when you sit here and, 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 and she asks you, do you want to do something? You say no. You got to answer 20,000 more questions. Well, why do you not want to do it? Is there some reason going on that you haven't told me about? I mean, it, it, did you do it with someone else already? And if you didn't do it with someone else already, why did you not think to do it with me? There's all of these questions. I know they can work your nerves, but we got to stop being punks. We got to start learning how to talk, how to communicate, and stop thinking that it, it, resolving something requires us to lay hands on it. The only time you should lay hands on your woman is because you're making love to her. Amen. Amen. I know, I know we are older. I know that probably cringe your, your, your ears to hear it, but, but, but the only time a man should lay hands on a woman is to love her, to hug her, to caress her, to show her how much she means. And here's another thing. I don't think the problem is any of the men in here. I think the problem is the men out there. But many of us are so busy trying to go along, to get along, that we know fellas that are punk abusers, but we won't call them out on it. We let them continue abusing, knowing that they're hurting, killing somebody, because we just don't want there to be a hard time. I'm telling you, the one thing a, 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 an abuser won't do is hit another man. He will not hit another man. In fact, any time I've been out and I've seen an abuser and some man step, the abuser pushes back. And you know what saves him? is the woman being abused. Because she knows that whoever just stepped to her husband or her boyfriend is about to hurt this man. But we see this. So let me come back to my sermons. We see this all the time, but we don't say anything about it. And I wonder how we would function if God did to us what he did to this man. If because we're not seeing things, discerning things, distinguishing things uh, with the sight he gives us, what if he made us blind today? Some of us be in trouble because some of us have to stay at the church. You ain't got anyone to drive you home today. Or you got to call Uber. And so God shared him. I said, oh my God, God, that's what you want to do? He said, yeah. And God said, I got three questions I want to ask you. 
And he asked me, you know, he instructed me to ask you the questions. So I'm going to ask you the three questions, and I'm going to try to give you some potential answers to the three questions. So the first question that God wants us, wants to ask us, do we see the people around us as they really are? Do we see the people around us as they really are? Let me say this. I know you don't know this about me. You've never seen this. It's probably a new thing you're about to learn at this moment. But I'm a people person. I like people. There's never any place I go where in five minutes of going there, I haven't struck up a conversation with someone. In fact, uh, my wife, my oldest child, and my middle child all complain. Like, oh my God, there he is talking to someone again. My oldest child says to me all the time, Daddy, you don't have to talk to everybody everywhere you go. In fact, some people don't even want to talk to you. And you're making them talk to them, talk to you. You should just chill out and be quiet. And my wife be egging it on. Tell him, girl, because he won't listen to me when I tell him that. Now she got my little baby girl saying it. Daddy, come on, stop talking. Stop, please, please leave him alone. Let's go home. I'm a people's person. Amen. Praise God. Uh, but something I realized about me being a people's person, I had to come to re re realize that I'm such a people's person that I'm so busy being personal bold to people that I was not picking up on their body language on what they were presenting. I was so busy wanting to be a good neighbor and be neighborly to someone that I failed to be a good neighbor. That here it is, persons, because they knew my, my, my position both secularly and spiritually were trying to hint to me that something was wrong, but I was so busy trying to proselytize, so busy trying to ask them, what you doing Sunday morning? You going to come down to church? That I didn't realize they were asking me to meet them where they are and what they're going through. Can no one take advantage and, and, and enjoy the beach if in their life there's a hurricane on the beach. It's sunny for you, but it's a hurricane for them. You first got to deal with the hurricane before they even notice that there's a beach to relax on. And the problem is, many of us, are, are we've got the whole ostrich with our heads in the ground thing. I don't mind being your friend as long as being your friend doesn't require anything from me. I, I, I've, I, I've, I, I've got some boys. Amen, Brother Sean. Uh, I've got some boys. And I really hate them. I hate them not because I don't like them. I hate them because I love them and I know they love me. Because my boys will get into my stuff at the slightest indication. There were times when we were in college, my mama called me and she don't round me up. And so I share with them what she said to me. And I'm expecting them to say, nah, your mama need to treat you better than that. They be like, no, your mama right. <laughs> Listen here, Ninja, uh-uh, you my friend. Not then she got her friends. I'm thinking they want to be her friend. No, your mama right. There have been times I've been just as adamant that I've been right with my wife about something. She's like, no, you're wrong. You know, you, you're wrong. I tell my boys, my boys are not only you wrong, but you damn wrong. You need to go. And I appreciate that. Because guess what, my friends, and I do the same thing for them. We don't see each other as we want each other to be. We see each other as we are. Same thing here. God has given us this blessed ability to see but he's also given us this ability to discern what we see to see you know Superman got x-ray vision so do Christians if we would stop and pay attention we could see someone going through something in fact every time look at Jesus every time he walks some place he sees someone suffering and it's not like those persons just started suffering when Jesus stepped foot around the corner They've been suffering for a while. 
The man that was in the uh, synagogue, possessed by the demon that Jesus called out. The demon had been coming to the synagogue for a while. That wasn't his first time there. The man with the leprosy, it wasn't his first time there. The man sitting beside the portico, it wasn't his first time at the portico. The, 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 the people not having anything to eat, it wasn't the first time for that, that to happen. It had happened many times, but the people that God had charged with being his leaders, being his servants, could not see the people as they, as they really were, as they are. And Jesus comes up and the first thing it, the word always says, he saw them or he took notice of them. That indicates everybody had not. So the first question that God asked us this morning is, do we see the people around us as they really are? Okay. Our second question is, do we see the actual problems and predicaments that other people are presently wrestling with? All right. Amen. Praise God. Uh, I said in the sermon a little while ago that ladies... Your husbands do not read you, cannot read your mind. Men, we cannot read you. We, we don't know what you are dealing with at any particular given moment. There ain't no need to get mad. There ain't no need to accuse your man of not knowing you or not loving you. We don't know. However, brothers, there should be some warning that something's wrong. Let, let, let me help you. Amen. And praise God. I'm coming down the road, Pastor. Don't, don't you worry. Amen. Amen. I, I tell brothers all the time that if you walk in your house and you ask your wife or your girl how she doing and she responds with fine, Negro, everything is getting ready to be problems. Fine is an indication that I really want you to ask me what's going on and talk to me what's going on. But if you're stupid enough to walk by thinking when I say I'm fine, I'm really fine, then we, it's about to be on up in here. Look at my brother over here. Look at his, look at his, look at his, look at his sister. He's looking at her like, huh, huh, well, that, uh huh, right. Thought I was picking on you the other day. No, no, no. I, 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 Whenever she says fine, I know there's a problem. I know that either I've done something or the kids have done something. And even if the kids did something, I've learned that it's still my fault because I gave her those kids. <laughs> you got to learn how to pick up on persons. Remember I told you I'm a very people person. Uh, I'm very personable. And so I remember one time I was at Hampton. I was with my friends. And the whole time I was quiet. I didn't say anything. And so I saw them watching me, but they didn't really say anything. And so I remember one day, Yoruba and Terrence, I had gone, I left them, went back to my room, went to lay down. I really was not feeling well. I wasn't in the, laying down for 20 seconds for knocking on the door. And it wasn't a nice night it was a boom 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 and her tear said open this gd door we about to take you to the emergency room and so i went oh, i said what i said what are you hollering for they're like negro you ain't been the loud bubbly person you normally are all day long come on get in the car we're taking you to the emergency room they took me to the emergency room i had a 102 degree fever and almost immediately upon getting to the, uh, to the emergency room, I started vomiting as part of the, having the flu. And it actually, the nurse told my friends, thank you for getting him when you, here when you got him here, because it would have been worse if you had just let him stay there. They were paying attention to me enough to recognize that something was wrong. Are we paying attention to the people around us to recognize something is wrong? Let me tell you something. I always hear Sean before I see him on Sunday mornings. Amen. Praise God. Amen. It, it, it's a good thing. Amen. Praise God. Amen. I'm, I'm back there and I can hear him at the front door. Amen. Praise God. Uh, and I've gotten used to it. In fact, I've gotten to come to a spectacle. Like this morning, he tried to tiptoe in without saying anything. But I said, like, where did you come from? Usually I hear him. Uh, amen. 
But knowing that about Sean, if Sean isn't acting the way he normally does, that's a clue something is wrong. Not only that, but guess what? Many people will show you they're hurting. Have you ever been talking to someone, you mention something, and all of a sudden they break down and start crying? They're hurting. That's not your chance for you to say, oh, okay, I forgot. I've got a Zoom meeting in 10 minutes. Let me run to my Zoom meeting. That's for you to minister to them. And ministering to them is not always, well, God will work it out. Sometimes it's sitting there listening. It's hearing what the problem is. And it is giving constructive advice of how to deal with it. Yes, we know God is going to work it out. But tell me how. Yeah. Help me. Tell me that I'm not alone in this thing. Tell me that I'm not... They're not crazy and feeling like this. Tell me that what I'm going through is a valid experience. See, that's what happens when you can see someone and what they're going through. You validate who they are. And if there's nothing else that Jesus does with people, he validates them. He, he says to them, you are a, a, a not only a person, but a member of God's household, whether you are Israelite or not. And guess what, sister? Guess what, brother? Guess what, daughter? Guess what, son? You are, you have meaning. Are being able to see each other and, and the problems. Maybe the man was blind because... He could see people, but he, he was ignoring, intentionally ignoring the problems and predicaments of the people that, that he, he was around. Amen. So our first point is, do you actually see people for who they, as they really are? Our second point this morning, is, do you see the actual problems and predicaments that other people are presently wrestling with? And our third point, third question this morning, do we realize that what Christ Jesus wants most from us, Christian disciples and stewards, is to see other people as they really are and what they are really experiencing at this very moment? Okay, so... Let me show it to you in the scripture. These, this man can't see. Amen. People have brought this man to Jesus, imploring him, begging him to help this man see again. Jesus pulls this man to the side. He does for this man what we see him do for another man. He basically spits, creates spittle. And rubs it on the man's face. I, I told you before what I think that is. I think that it's the creator moistening the, the clay, the, the, the dust, to turn it back to clay, to reform it, reshape it, reconfigure it so that when it dries this time, it's operational, operating just the way God intended. So he does that. And so what happens when he, he does, he says, so tell me what you see. Uh, what do you see? And the man tells him, I see uh, people and they look like trees walking. Uh, Jesus realizes at that moment the problem is not simply that he can't see he can't see properly amen a a a amen amen it the first time he rubs his eye the man gets his sight back but the problem is the man is seeing like he saw before through a, what, what, what's, what's the Shakespeare court? Through a, 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 a glass darkling? Or, or, or I miss mean, Paul. Through a glass darkling? They're not seeing the full picture. He's not seeing the full picture. And so Jesus has to literally take it upon himself to meet this man where he is and correct his sight so that he can see properly. Okay. You have been put in someone's life to help them see. You've been put in someone's life to help them hear. You have even been put in someone's life to help them declare. Amen. That's why I say to you all the time, seeing you each and every Sunday makes me preach good. Amen. Because I recognize it doesn't matter how well I do today, next Sunday you're going to want more. And if, I feed, and if I feed you porterhouse today, you're going to want a ribeye next week. Yeah. And if I give you a ribeye next week, you're going to want uh, the wild goose steak the week after that. 
You know, every week you're going to want more because you, you're, you're, I'm giving you the best. So you make me preach well. God has called you to help someone proclaim. God has called you to help someone become educated. God has called you to help someone rise a certain position within a company or a profession. God has called you to be uh, uh, the, the surrogate mother and father that someone so desperately needs. And the problem is, it's not simply that they don't have it, it's that they've got some portion of it. They can recognize something of it in their lives, but they are not able to fully use it because they don't understand what it is they have. Amen. Many times the person that you will be called to help have already what you've been called to help them with. You've just been called to help them use it in a way that glorifies God. So let me help you because I'm, I'm, I'm finished now. I'm, I'm finished now. So let me wrap this thing up so that we can enjoy our day to day. Let me help you with, with two things. First of all, yes, you have purpose. That when God created you, he did not create you to be a random being walking on the earth. God created you so that you could fulfill purpose. And fulfilling purpose is helping someone else attain purpose. Many times, many people don't know what their purposes are until they interact with us. Come and tell the truth. You know how we hear it. We hear it all the time. I didn't know I wanted to be a teacher, Beverly, until I was in uh, Miss Clement's class in third grade. I, I didn't know I wanted to be a dentist until I went to go see uh, 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 Dr. Brown and saw how, how he operated. I didn't know I wanted to be a pastor until I heard Pastor Al preaching and I wanted to declare the word just like Pastor Al. See, I was supposed to laugh at that one. Amen. Someone doesn't realize their purpose until, amen. I don't find my purpose the other way. My purpose is to sing, y'all. Pastor Leslie and Brother Sonny, that's right. You can hold your foreheads as much as you want to, but amen. My purpose is to sing. And guess what? I got that from two people that can sing. Amen. 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 Hey, y'all going to suffer through this just like I am. Amen. Praise God. I'm going to work. Hey, hey, if y'all, you know what? Because y'all trip me out. You know why y'all trip me out? Because when y'all come to me about something you did or did not do and I have to fuss at you, the first thing you want to say to me is, well, pastor, I'm a work in progress. Jesus loves me. Jesus doing all this wonderful. If you don't get off your hands, Sister Mahogany over there talking about, ooh, he on my page. I'm just sitting on my hands. They, hey, hey, amen. And it, 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 I'm a work in progress. Same thing. I'm a work in progress. One day I'm going to sound just like Luther Van Dross. Hey, 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 amen. I'm going to sound, amen. It's gonna be, I'm going to sound so good. And when y'all come in here, I'm going to be like, don't talk. Just, just sing your sermon. Just sing your sermon. <laughs> just sing your sermon. Just sing it. Just sing it. Just sing it. But I say, I make you laugh, I say all that to say we each have purpose and many times we don't know the purpose until someone helps us recognize our purpose. Same thing, God has called you to help someone else recognize purpose. The second point, or the second thing I want to tell you that I'm going to sit down, amen, praise God. That means you got to stop diminishing, demeaning, negating uh, your purpose. You got, you got to stop speaking down on your purpose don't you know the enemy is already speaking down on you enough the world is already talking bad about you enough why then does your, do, do you need you talking bad about you I mean you ought, you ought to be telling uh, you know Cat Williams says every morning he gets up and tells himself terrible lies he gets up and says you know what uh you had a growth spurt life last night. You must have grown five, six inches. You know, you know, you you really are taller than what you are. It's just the mirrors in the world make people look shorter. I mean, he said he wakes up telling himself terrible lies. I'm encouraging you to wake up telling yourself some incredible truths. You are beautiful. You are worth it. You are worthy of all the love in the world. You know what? You deserve to be the CEO. 
I know right now you're the lowest man on the totem pole, but guess what? So was the CEO at one point. At one point, he or she was in their bathroom mirror saying to themselves, you deserve to be the CEO. And if they can do it, I can do it too. You deserve to be educated. You deserve to get a college education. I don't care if your mama and your daddy never went to school. I don't care if no one around you saw the need to go to school. You all deserve to be educated. And where there's a will, there's a way. You deserve to be whole. You deserve to be healed. You deserve all the blessings that God has, has for you. And you need to tell yourself that. Tell yourself that to the point that yourself is, is actually walking up like, hey you, it's so good to see you again. I was telling my homeboy, I said, ain't no one gonna do better at, at, at making me feel good than me. Amen. Hey, 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 you, you, you can't talk better about me than I can. You, 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 you can't highlight what I do better than I can. And since that's the truth, then let me start telling my, I got to tell you, and ain't none of your business who I am. But let me start telling myself who I am. And especially anytime someone tries to tell me who I'm not, let me sit there and start reminding myself, like, oh, excuse me, hold on a second. What you say, self? Oh, we are the S-H-I-T. Oh, good. I got you. I, 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 got, I, I, I got you. I got you. So they were lying to me, right? Oh, good, good, good. A amen. Amen. Uh, what, what you say? You, you can't sing out? Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. What? I don't need any music. I can go a cappella all the time. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Hey, amen. That's what myself be saying to myself when y'all tell me I can't sing. And you all to take, and, and, and if nothing else, if you can't talk good about you, talk good about the God that you serve. I serve a God that can do above and beyond anything that I can think or imagine. I serve a God that, that do all that treats me and gives me all power. I serve a God that loved me so much that got off his throne in heaven and came down and died just for me. I serve a God who could have walked by me, who could have passed by me, but so me exactly where I was. I serve a God that recognized that I was broken and I was hurt and I was less than that, that I was depressed and dejected and rejected and isolated and, 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 su and, and suffering from extreme trauma. And I serve a God that thought it not robbery to come over there and to pick me up and to carry me in his bosom. And while he's carrying me, he's cleaning me off. He's, he's wiping me off. He's dusting me off. He's doing all this stuff to me so that when he put me back down, I didn't look like what I've been through. I looked like brand new money. I looked like a car that had been completely restored. I looked like I came off, I just came off the factoring line. That's because the God I serve is amazing and incredible. The God I serve is a God of love. The God I serve is a God of another chance. I know someone thought I I was going to say a second chance. But the truth is, we are way beyond second chances. In fact, we are somewhere on the two millionth chance. And thank God for him not keeping a track of the number of chances that he's given me and giving you. How many times has he had to tell you the same thing over and over, Sean, before you got it? And when you got it, it was new news to you, but it was old news to heaven. That's because of God you serve loves you so much. The God you serve cares about you so much. The God you serve really wants to do something in you. Therefore, in order for him to do something in you, we've got to open our eyes and start seeing the way he wants us to see. we got to start noticing things the way he wants us to notice them. we got to start assessing and discerning things the way he wants us to assess and discern it. And if we can do that, then not only will He'll enable us to see more, but he'll, enable, he'll use us to help someone else see. And that's really what it's about. When you get a whole community of people that can see the way God sees, then you have a community that's ready to do the impossible, the incredible, and the wonderful. Someone ought to give God a praise clap. Someone ought to give God a celebratory thank you. 
Because at some point he said, I'm tired of seeing you walking around here blind. I want you to see and to see properly. And so if you are wondering if God has ever done something for you that's worthy of your praise, well, this week on Thanksgiving, I want you to say to God, thank you, God, for loving me. Thank you, God, for blessing me. Thank you, God, for forgiving me. Thank you, God, for giving me sight. Thank you, God, for letting me see others. Thank you, God, for letting me see solutions to problems. Thank you, God, for letting me see opportunities in the midst of no opportunities. Thank you, God, for letting me see open doors that are closed. Thank you, God, for letting me see closed doors that are open. Thank you, God, for giving me a chance to exemplify your goodness, your grace, and your mercy every single day. Thank you, God. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. God is good all the time. What do you see? That's the question that God is asking us right now. In fact, for someone, he's asking that question in terms of what do you see before you at this minute for someone he is offering salvation he has brought this gift in this bit box wrapped in all the pretty wrapping with the bows on it and the streamers and all that and he set it down in front of each of us and I saw it Deacon Sean saw it but someone under the sound of my voice has not seen it. And you haven't seen it for whatever reason. Sometimes they haven't seen it because you're just not aware it's there. Other times they haven't seen it because they have, and they're intentionally trying to ignore it. But if God is asking you right now, what do you see in terms of salvation? The response from you should be an opportunity, a chance to finally be right with you, God. And so, Right now, I want to help you see that gift. And not only do I want to help you see that gift, I want to help you uh, uh, possess it, to own it, to live with it. And so, this is what I want you to do. In the free part, in, the, in, in your heart and in your mind, I want you to pray this prayer uh, with me. Dear Father God, creator of the heavens and the earth, God, I come to you right now thanking you, God, for enabling me to see. I thought I could see. I mean, I saw the door before me. I see the chairs around me. I see the people in my environment. But God, you have helped me to understand that while I can see, I see dimly. I see partly that I don't see the whole picture. And one of the reasons why I don't see the whole picture is because I'm not connected to the source. I'm not connected to you. I don't have a relationship with you, God. And so I'm only being able to see that portion of the picture. <laughs> I really want to see all of it. I really want to see everything, God, that you have for me to see. And so, God, I not only admit and acknowledge that there is a gift sitting in front of me, but today's the day I'm going to open that gift. I'm going to rip off the paper. I'm going to rip off, rip off the streamers and the bow, and I'm going to open the top of that gift, and I'm going to reach down, and I'm going to pull out the salvation that you have for me. And I'm going to put it on and I'm going to wear that salvation. In fact, I'm never taking it off. I'm going to wear it to bed. I'm going to wear it to work. I'm going to wear it when I'm uh, uh, working in the yard or when I'm playing with, with, with friends. I'm going to wear it on vacation. I'm going to wear it in my everyday travels. I'm going to wear it at the grocery store. I'm going to wear it at the hardware store. I'm going to wear it until there's no longer a need for me to wear it. I'm able to meet you face to face, God. Thank you, God, for your son, for him loving me the way that he does, he has. Thank you, God, for sending him to earth to walk amongst us and to 
experience what we experience as human beings so that there's no sin, no temptation that we cannot bring to you, God, for your son has experienced it himself. Father God, I pray that God, as me and others are walking through life, that we realize that we're walking the same walk that Jesus was walked. And not only that, but we have hope because Jesus went to a cross where they hung him high and stretched him wide. And they did that because he was on assignment to nail sin to the cross. They accused him, they tried him, they convicted him, they brutalized him, and then they hung him on a cross. And he said, stay there, God, not saying a mumbling word. In fact, when he did talk, he said, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. When he did talk, he did, he said to a, someone who deserved to be on the cross, from this day forward, you shall be with me in my father's heaven. When he did talk, he was quoting the scripture, Eli, Eloi, Eloi, Sabakatani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When he did speak, God, he commanded his spirit into your hands, God, and he surrendered the ghost. Not only that, God, but you allowed him to go down into hell, God, and minister to the captives there. So that on the day of judgment, all of us may see you, experience you, behold you face to face. And if that wasn't good enough, he gave us a guarantee of that day. That early one Sunday morning, you resurrected him to life. That you, you, you commanded death to release its grip on him. And you commanded life to, to bring him back into this reality. And God, you raise him with all power uh, of life and, and, and the kingdom in his hands. And right now, God, he's the one making intercession for me and for others just like me. He's the one that has basically prepared the gift that I'm accepting today. Thank you, God, for Jesus. Thank you, God, for what you have given us through Jesus. And God, we pray that as we all continue to walk with you, we will continue to grow in faith, grow in knowledge, to become servants that bring you glory, honor, and praise. It's in your son's mighty matchless, marvelous, magnificent name that we do pray. Amen. Amen, everyone. Amen. For some of us who prayed that prayer for the very first time, we call that a sinner's prayer. Amen. Every believer had to pray a prayer like that. This is not the first time that we've ever prayed that prayer, and it will not be the last time. You'll hear me pray a prayer similar to that next Sunday. Uh, amen. And so... What we want you to do, if this is the first time you've heard that prayer and you pray that prayer and you sincerely declare the truth in that prayer, then I want you to know that you are saved. You have received salvation. That you are no longer who you were when you first came in here or turned on your computer or tablet or cell phone or whatever mobile device, uh, electronic device that you're watching us on. You're no longer that person. You are now a new creature in Christ. And here's the thing I want you to know. Then in the natural, we don't birth babies, put them in the corner and say, hey, take care of yourself. We raise them, we nurture them, we comfort them, we provide for them, we protect them until they can take care of themselves. Same thing in the spirit. God does not birth spiritual babes in Christ and then we say, hey, you're on your own. We walk with you, we nurture you, we help you grow into that which God would have you to be. Therefore, I want to do that with you. Amen. If you're here, come down here, talk to me at some point after the service so we're getting ready to end if you're watching us on uh live stream facebook youtube this is what i want you to do i want you to either go to facebook send me a message to, through my facebook profile al kennan there it is or send me an email pastor al kennan the third at gmail.com send me that email 
or send me that private message and what we'll do we'll begin this walk together in Christ so that you may become exactly who it is God wants you to be amen amen let's do 